Welcome to Deep Dive, everybody. I'm Margaret Leinen, Director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And during this series, uh, I speak to scientists here at Scripps to take a deep dive into some of the really fascinating work that they're doing. And today, uh, we're joined by Dr. Deirdre Lyons, DD. Lyons is an assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She is part of the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine in the biology section. Didi is a cell and molecular biologist, and she studies evolutionary developmental biology and gene regulation of development. And we're going to hear from her about what those are and what they encompass. Didi's research compares developmental patterns in different animal embryos to understand how diversity arose through evolution. Much of her work focuses on mollusks because these groups have unique advantages for the study of evolutionary development and cell biology. She is also a UC San Diego lead fellow. That's a leader for equity, advancement, and diversity. And she walks the talk. She recently received the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in postdoctoral scholar mentoring. So, Didi, hello. Thanks for joining us. So, can, hello. You, can you tell us a little bit more about what evolutionary developmental biology and gene regulation are all about? Sure. Thanks for having me. So, to talk about developmental biology in its broadest sense, that's the study of how a single cell, a fertilized egg, becomes an entire organism with all of its shapes and abilities to behave and its physiology and its form. And if you take a slightly wider view of that, it's not only just the first form that that organism takes, but it's its entire lifespan, what it's able to do. For instance, uh, if parts are cut off of an organism, can it regenerate? If it needs to respond to its environment to fight off a pathogen, what does it do? As well as how does it senesce? How does it get old and eventually die? So we're interested in the entire process of development, which is basically birth all the way to death. And we are trying to study that at a molecular level. So there are many different ways you could study that process of life and death. You could study it from a biophysical uh, level. You could study it from a morphogenesis or tissue level. You can study its proteins and you can always also study how those cells become different from one another in the first place, which is the study of gene regulation. So we know that every cell in your body has the same DNA, but obviously you have different parts that are able to do different things. And that's because different genes are expressed. And so to understand how that happens in the lifetime of one organism is one of the things we're interested in, but also how do those processes get modified over evolutionary time to make things different like a squid or a human or a starfish. So I said that you work on mollusks <laughs> and that there were some advantages to mollusks. So tell us, which mollusks you work on and why there are advantages. Yeah, sure, thanks. So I study two uh, species of mollusks in particular. One is called a slipper snail. That's a marine snail that is pretty sedentary and has a big shell and uh, lives in a lot of different marine uh, environments with different species. And I also study nudibranchs. So those are shellless mollusks that uh, crawl around and have to, to um, interact with their environment without the shell. And so one of the reasons we study mollusks in the first place is because of the great diversity that they hold within animal form and function. So things um, from a clam all the way to something like an octopus, there's a lot of morphological diversity and habitat diversity and different niches that those organisms have have reached. And we're trying to understand where that diversity comes from. And the other reason that I study these particular species is that they are very easy to work with as embryonic systems. So they make a lot of embryos. The embryos are easy to access and work with. And really important for my work to try and understand the function of how genes control development and biology is that I can manipulate the genes within these organisms because I can deliver reagents or molecules into the cells, especially in the early embryo, to be able to perturb gene function and understand what the relationship between sequence and function of a particular gene is. And uh, yeah, then I think I think that's it. <laughs> so I know that um, some of these are considered model organisms. What are model organisms and you know, how much of this is 
you know, just understanding things for evolution versus things that might be valuable in terms of um, human disease, human development, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question. So traditionally, we have thought of model organisms as a way to model a, a condition outside of a, of a human. So let's say we want to be able to study cancer, but we can't experiment on, on humans. So we look at cancerous situations in other organisms. Um, and there's lots of examples of what you might want to develop a model for a human disease for. And traditionally, scientists have chosen a very few number of organisms to do that type of modeling in. So mice are one of them. So they're similar to, to humans in that they're mammals and they have certain advantages because of that biology that's similar. But they'd have also gone out to even further distantly related organisms like zebrafish, which uh, are aquatic or nematodes that live in the soil or Drosophila, which are small little arthropods. And it turns out that we can study these other types of organisms and relate it to human health because many of the genes are conserved. So if you look at the complement of genes that are in a human, you find many similar genes or what we call homologs in all of those organisms. So once that was discovered and that was discovered through uh, work on developmental biology and genetics, then it became possible for us to study how genes function in these other organisms which are easier to keep in the lab, which are smaller, and that um, can really get at mechanistic level types of studies of genes and proteins and, and even their chemistry that we cannot do in, in humans. And the reason that those organisms were picked were because there was a lot of classical genetics that had been worked on them. And so much effort took was needed to develop those tools and those systems that the whole um, cater of, of kind of developmental and cell biology and geneticists all focus on a few number of organisms to be able to get to that level of understanding. But with the advent of next generation sequencing and the ability to use CRISPR technology to genome edit in a larger range of organisms, now all of biology can be opened up to understand this mechanistic level of understanding of genes. And we may want to expand the range of organisms that we study so that we can understand more about how biology works in a larger diversity of organisms. Tell us a little bit about editing genes and CRISPR. And we all know that the two uh, people most responsible for the development of the CRISPR technology just won the Nobel Prize. Yeah. So obviously, not only is it really important, but it was recognized as being very important almost instantly. I mean, we've only had this technology for a short time. So tell us a little bit about that and, you know, how you edit genes and why it's important to edit the genes. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think um, one of the great stories about CRISPR, uh, aside from just the biology itself, the discovery itself as a tool for manipulating genes, is that it really was born out of basic research. So um, these labs, one of which was in uh, my graduate program, Jennifer Doudna, as I got my PhD in the program that in the department that she works in, they were really studying basic biology about how bacteria handle invasion of viruses. How, how do bacteria fight off viruses? Just like <laughs> we all know we're, uh, it's important for human health these days, how to fight, how you deal with viruses in your environment. And from that basic biology, they discovered the surveillance mechanism that bacteria have to fight off viruses. And they found that different bacteria have different ways of using CRISPR. There are all different flavors of CRISPR now. There's this diversity of how it works. And from that basic biology work, um, this incredible tool was discovered. And so by this um, same type of analogy, we're interested in trying to understand the diversity of, of things that live in the ocean and how they work, because there could be a lot of new biology that exists. But before CRISPR existed, it was very hard to test those assumptions. So you might find an interesting phenomenon, for instance, let's say how corals take up their endosymbiotic um, algae. We can we have can describe that process and have a guess of how it works, but without being able to manipulate the genes on either side from the algae or from the coral, we can't really test our hypotheses about how it works. Now with CRISPR, the ability to go in and have a tool, a molecular tool that is modifiable to any particular gene sequence, and then we can cut and perturb that gene, that allows us now all this amazing tool to get into the functional biology of how particular proteins work. And we are interested in applying those questions to, to mollusks as well in my lab. So what, what kinds of genes in the mollusks are you going to crisp? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So for instance, my lab is really interested in one of the things that makes mollusks very famous, how they make their shell. 
So the molluscan shell is not only very beautiful, if you've ever gone to comb the beach, lots of people are interested in collecting shells, but it's also really crucial for the organism's survival. And there's a lot of different types of molluscan shells. And when you look at the microstructure of it, people have, for decades have known that there are proteins that get secreted outside of the cells that in a special kind of milieu and physiology um, are, la are, are able to control crystal growth. So that's called a, a biomineral. There's actually a protein and an inorganic portion of it. And the theory is that these proteins that go into the biomineral are controlling its structure, con controlling its pigmentation, controlling how it's constructed itself, why it's reflective. So when you open an abalone or look in, inside an oyster and see a pearl, that shiny part of the, of the material is different than the rest of the kind of more dull material that's on the outside. So the theory is that these proteins um, and the ecology of those proteins inside the shell are what is giving it its physical properties and um, uh, and the and the way it looks. And so we want to actually test that. And very few studies have been able to actually CRISPR or cut or break those genes, those matrix proteins we call them, to see whether that actually is true and whether if you take certain proteins away, it'll change the physical properties. And we're excited to do this not only to understand how the shell works and how shell diversity might arise, but also to be able to access um, understanding of the mollusk shell for biomimicry. So if we want to build synthetic materials that use these principles, we need to be able to understand it at a really molecular level. So you mentioned the proteins, and actually it's a lead into my next question. Uh, so I know that you are interested in proteomics right. and transcriptomics uh, in this big house that is all the omics. Yes. Uh, so tell us what transcriptomics is and why you're interested, and then proteomics. Great, yeah. So as I mentioned, we all have a similar DNA sequence in each one of our cells. So um, you can do, you can understand the DNA sequence by sequencing genomes. That's what, one of the omics, genomics. Uh, then if you want to understand those, um, what I said about differential expression, meaning how do the cells become different from one another, that's actually mRNAs that are made from that DNA template. And to understand that, then we would study the transcripts. That's what the messages are that come off the mRNA. And so that's where transcriptomics comes from. We're studying the mRNAs that are expressed that are different in different cells. So for instance, uh, a a kind of a hot technique that people are doing right now is single cell transcriptomics. So they separate individual cells and you can study just one cell and say, what are all the transcripts in this cell versus another cell? So for us, what is made in the cells that give rise to the shell versus the cells that give rise to the foot in a mollusk. And then you can go one step further into proteins. So proteomics is studying and sequencing all the proteins that are made by a particular cell. So we recently did that by doing proteomics on the mollusk shell itself. So we just took the shell, not the cells, and sequenced all of the proteins there to understand what's inside that matrix. And so this collectively um, is what in the developmental biology world, we kind of say like the finding it step. You need to find the particular proteins and genes that are associated with the structure or, um, or physiology that you want to study. Hmm. It's sort of like the unwrapping layers of the onion. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, um, not not quite the right metaphor. Maybe uh, it works. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Um, so you also uh, do a lot of work that is involves transgenics and transgenics or transgenic organisms. So yeah. what are they, and how does that fit into this whole way that you start unwrapping the the um, the organism? Yeah, that's a great question. So as I mentioned, a lot of organisms have been have been developed into model systems. For instance, mice or C. elegans, which is a nematode or fly, which is uh, Drosophila. And a lot of that work involves making them transgenic, meaning changing the sequence of that of that gene in a particular organism and then allowing it to propagate and have offspring, the next generation that are also modified. And you can do that by classical genetics which would be like doing EMS screens where you are mute, you add a mutagen and you change the DNA sequence. But now of course people are doing it with CRISPR. So you can modify or break a gene that is not detrimental to the life of that organism. And then you can grow that up and have a line of those organisms that, um, that have that change in DNA. And so that would be a transgenic organism. And not only can you take genes away or break genes, but you could also add genes in. So for instance, uh, 
typical thing that people do is add a fluorescent tag. So something like a, a green fluorescent protein sequence to the gene of interest. And then you can see that protein that is eventually made in real time because now it's glowing green. So for instance, we'd love to make a transgenic line of snails that are having one of these matrix proteins be tagged with fluorescent tags. So we can see the shell forming in real time, for example. And you need transgenics to do that and transgenic facilities to, to hold them. Yeah, okay. So that so now we're starting to understand, you know, what you're doing with the organisms and uh, all of the ways that you can look at them and how they develop. How does this relate to human health and to uh, biomedicine and all of the, the things that individuals are concerned about with their own health? Exactly. That's a great question. So what we really want to do is a lot of the problems um, in human health are no longer just finding what the molecular genetic basis of a particular disease is. But how do we solve the problem? If something's gone wrong, well, how do we fix it? So for instance, um, you know, when we lose a limb and we want to be able to regenerate a tissue or something is uh, has to be removed from our bodies because it's diseased and we need to replace it with something, how do we solve those problems? Um, and so what we really want to do is look at the broad range of the way organisms solve problems and be able to harness some of that information. So for instance, if we could use the information about how, to mo how a mollusk makes its shell, we could make some type of biomimetic synthetic matrix protein um, to fix uh, human problems as well as other biological problems. So for instance, often an issue is that the bottom of ships get covered with organisms that are living on them. And if we could and many of them make proteins or make shells, and that's why they're so hard to get off. So if we could design some type of a material or substance that prevents that shell from forming, that would help you know, this uh, kind of engineering issue. But we could also maybe regrow uh, the dentine on our teeth or help to regrow our bones. And so not only do we want just one or two models that help us study things about human, but we want the entire diversity of, of biological uh, innovation to be able to solve any type of problem we want. And different organisms have solved a lot of, of biology's problems. We want to harness the experiments that evolution has done to help us solve problems about human health. So it might not even be just, uh, you know, I cut off my finger and I want to regrow the bone, but maybe we could regrow bone outside of people. Uh, and then use it to, is, is that all? Exactly, so we could do that. Or for instance, how about um, what do organisms that make a shell in a very highly acidic environment or very cold environment or a, a, an environment where the water is much warmer? We're worried about um, organisms handling climate change or diseases. How is it that other organisms have solved that problem? Just like we use CRISPR because bacteria had solved how to fight out viruses, we want to look at all the different ways organisms have solved problems and be able to use that information to, to help with our specific issues. So I know that you and another faculty member, Amro Hamdoun, uh, are developing ideas for a transgenic facility. And what would that look like? What would you do in a transgenic facility and what would go on there? Yeah, great. So one of the, as I mentioned, one of the reasons that people had picked the models for biomedicine, like mice or flies or nematodes, is that they're small, they develop very quickly, they're easy to keep in lab, they're very low maintenance, and that and that was great. Um, one of the reasons that some other organisms like mollusks have not been used, or, or sea urchins, for example, even though they have a long history of being used for Nobel Prize winning research and a lot of different communities that work on them is that they have not been very easy to grow in, in the lab. We often use them in the wild. And so Amro has this great metaphor that if you were a mouse biologist, you wouldn't go and trap a mouse every day and bring it into the lab and do an experiment with it. You have lines of mice that have a known genotype with known um, features that you can study and not worry about natural variation. So that's what we're trying to do for mollusks and echinoderms and our colleague Emma Farley is doing for uh, tunicates is to be able to grow these organisms generation after generation in set environment in the laboratory to be able to do experiments. And especially then if we knock GFP into them or we take a gene away, we'll be able to keep track of those organisms just the same way people keep track of lines of flies and mice. What's GFP? Oh yeah, so that's the a green fluorescent protein. So that's a protein that uh, people took from jellyfish 
that are naturally have a fluorescence to them. And we found that sequence, or not obviously not us, but <laughs> um, researchers who are working at marine labs were able to figure out which one of those proteins had that ability and then use that sequence so that we can basically knock it into or add it to any genome of any animal now, pretty much. Right, so that's what you were talking about, getting it to glow and watch it actually make the shell as right. you're, you're looking at it. Exactly, and that was Nobel Prize winning research based on a marine organism and using, again, it's the diversity of the ways that, that animals have solved problems uh, as a tool for our research. Yeah, so uh, how, un how unusual are transgenic facilities where this is done? Are there lots of them for lots of different kinds of organisms? Yeah, so I would say it's um, becoming more and more common as those these tools for being able to manipulate them have evolved, but I would still say they're pretty scarce. And so having something at SIO would, would really be groundbreaking and kind of setting the, the tone for the community to be able to have a, a facility with, especially with free flowing water. So that's one of the specialties of being near a marine lab with fresh water and also ones that have all of the control that's necessary to make sure that genetically modified organisms do not get back into the natural population. So that's another um, thing that if you work on terrestrial systems, you're, you're not necessarily worried about, you can just physically contain them. But with water, we uh, have gone to extra precautions to make sure that uh, nothing that we create would be able to get back into the Pacific Ocean. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking about students that, that um, come into this, and it's not the usual thing that you think about right away with the <laughs> marine biology. So um, do you find a lot of students, and how do they find you? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, well, these days, you know, uh, many professors and scientists have an online presence. So we put up a lot of beautiful pictures on our Twitter and lab websites. So some people come that way. Um, but a lot of students come to my lab through the classes that I teach. So I teach a class called Ecological Developmental Biology. So how is the environment directly controlling development? There's a famous phrase from a, the scientist Lee Van Valen that said, evolution is the control of development by ecology. So that's kind of the theme of that class. And then I also teach a lab class where the students come in and design their own projects around questions about marine biology and do their own experiments. And I find that that's one of the ways that students get the most excited is realizing where the edge of science is and that they can participate that in that directly is, is a real motivating factor for them, I think. That's great. Um, I know that um, when, when we talk to students uh, that, that are undergraduates, uh, the whole area of everything omic and, <laughs> and the, the uh, idea of being able to edit genes is something that they're really fascinated by and really interested in. So um, uh, just a, another question, uh, sort of out of the blue as I think about this, it, um, it raises, you know, our ability to do this with cells raises questions about whether we should be doing it and the ethics of uh, tinkering with the uh, with genetics and and uh, and these questions uh, how do you think about that and how do you and your students explore that as they think about it yeah I, that's a great question so we uh, in this class that I'm teaching this quarter we read Jennifer Dowden's book about um, about her discovery of CRISPR and kind of half of the book is dedicated to that just because we have the power to do something should we do it um, but if you put this this newfound, uh, the, the technique really is something that just allows you to have a lot more precision in what you do. For instance, humans have been creating crops and selectively breeding animals for thousands and thousands of years. So corn, for instance, is not a natural occurrence in uh, the world before humans came along and neither are cows or other things. So we have done this to the world already in many, in many ways all the time. And CRISPR, for instance, just gives us a much more precise way of doing it. And in some ways it can be thought of as a safer way to do it because we're doing it kind of one, one gene at a time. And of course, genetically modified organisms had existed already. So I think that is a, um, an issue that the, that the world is, is having to deal with. But I think the, the potential for, uh, human health and keeping everyone safe is is worth the risk. For instance, just the biology that led to being able to design a vaccine so fast or um, the ability to perhaps create organisms that are resilient to climate change, I think are really pressing 
issues or uh, being able to make food like impossible burgers and things like that, that are not um, sacrificing animals, I think is, is going to outweigh the, the risks to using this technology. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that you're talking about that specifically with your students because, uh, you know, I, I think we've never lived in a time when it was so possible to change not just our environment, we've been doing that through climate change and yeah. uh, overfishing and so forth, but to change what's in our environment and yeah. what's in us. And, uh, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. They usually talk about that Indeed. in politics, but I think that it's true in science too. Indeed. And I think it, it's also it's so many things we do, what what types of toxins we put in the environment, what types of, by our actions, what not only genetically modifying things, but in just in our environment in general, what are we doing to our environment? It's important. Yeah, absolutely. So it's been fantastic to, to talk to you about this. Um, Anything else that uh, that I haven't asked you about that you wish that I had? Oh, let's see. Um, no, I think I just think it's really important to think about the biology of the oceans, the untapped um, science that is in the oceans, and life evolved in the oceans. And I think it's really important to for people to keep that front and center, and to think of uh, diversity in their in their research and at all levels <laughs> is important. I think right. And it's so fantastic to think that some of these discoveries that we make in uh, here at Scripps and that you will make in your lab and with your your uh, capabilities will have re reverberations for people who want to solve problems for the planet and people who want to solve problems for human health. We're uh, here. Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're very proud to have you here at Scripps. And uh, it's exciting to hear about what you do. And I hope that this, this little deep dive will give others uh, a sense of the extraordinary range of, of biology that is done at Scripps. Thank That's you so thank much, you. Dee Dee. <laughs> thank you so much, Margaret.